Hello, uh, I'm Eamon Mackay. I'm the Director for Parliament and Institutions at the Irish Permanent Representation to the European Union. Delighted to welcome you to this, which is our seventh uh, series, uh, seventh in a series of webinars focusing on EU job opportunities. And today's webinar is going to focus on opportunities in the field of data protection in the EU institutions. Some of our previous webinars have looked at EU traineeships, at the question of Irish women in the EU institutions, at Irish language opportunities for lawyer linguists and proofreaders, at opportunities in the field of agriculture, health and food safety, and most recently, opportunities in the field of interpretation and translation. And our webinars can be watched back at any time at the DFA YouTube account. Um, Ireland's future prosperity is, of course, inextricably linked with our EU membership, and a strong understanding and connection with the EU's institutions is essential to ensuring that Ireland can effectively engage with the EU. And so with that in mind, the government uh, recently launched a strategy aimed at increasing Ireland's representation in the EU institutions and agencies. And along with several ambitious other measures in the strategy, these webinars form an important part of our efforts to boost our representation, i.e. the number of Irish people working in the EU institutions. Last Thursday, the EU launched a competition in the field of data protection with a deadline of the 12th of October. Today's webinar will provide more information on the competition and on the general policy area involved. The Department of Foreign Affairs provides various supports to Irish citizens who are applying for EU jobs. And we help at every step of the process, including online practice packs and one-to-one -one training, depending on the competition stage. So please do contact us if you are applying for EU jobs. And you can do that at eujobs at dfa.ie. The Department of Foreign Affairs EU jobs website has lots of practical advice for people who are interested in a career with the EU institutions. And I would encourage everyone to visit that site. Now, uh, I want to welcome our speakers for today. Uh, John Keyes is our Justice and Home Affairs attache here at the Irish Representation. Uh, he works on data protection and formerly worked with the Data Protection Commissioner um, he will briefly introduce the key aspects of this policy area in a moment and point to some key sources of material. Maria Serfiotti joins us from the European Personnel Selection Office, and she will give us an overview of the specifics of this competition. Christian de Kuna joins us from the Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Policy Unit in DG Connect, and he had previously worked for the European Data Protection Supervisor. So today he will talk about his current role and career path in the field. So a big thanks to our speakers for taking the time to join us today. We very much appreciate it. And um, towards the end of this webinar, you will have a chance uh, to ask your own questions using the Slido platform. Uh, and you can do that by going to the webpage slido and using the code hashtag EU jobs to access the system. You don't have to register, anyone can do this. It's a simple process and we invite you to do so if you have questions to ask. So look, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all today. Let's get started and over to our first speaker uh, and ask John to take the floor. John, over to you. Thank you, Eamon, and hello everybody. Uh, and thank you to my colleagues in the permanent representation, first of all, especially Eamon McKay, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you as you contemplate a new career in data protection here in the heart of the EU. Um, I don't need to tell you that data protection is a vast area um, and given the necessary time constraints today I thought I would cover three specific areas which I hope will give you valuable perspectives um, on some of the important things you can expect to encounter as you proceed uh, through this application process. Those three areas, first of all, uh, the importance of having a historical perspective on the development of data protection policy in Europe over the past 40 years. Uh, secondly, um, I'm going to offer some practical suggestions that might help you to demonstrate your ability to implement the rules on data protection in a working environment in the European institutions. Uh, and thirdly, I thought I'd share a personal ins insight with you into where I believe EU data protection policy might be heading in the future. 
Um, so let's get going with that straight away. Um, this historical perspective, you know, uh, there's a popular opinion, particularly in the US, that data protection law here in Europe de developed primarily from the experience of oppressive surveillance regimes in Eastern Europe, uh, particularly during the Soviet era. Um, but in fact, some European states had data protection laws in place uh, since the early 1970s. And uh, an important development in data protection in Europe, Convention 108 of the Council of Europe, um, dates back to 1981. So as you can see, uh, a lot of those important initial developments came long before the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, for, for example. Um, you know, the, the experience in Eastern Europe was no doubt an influencing factor for why Europeans value data protection uh, so much, but it's not the, the whole story. The, the actual um, uh, situation is that uh, Data protection grew in Europe in response to the rapid development of digital technologies, for example, the personal computer, the internet and smartphones, which allowed for large scale processing of personal data, uh, which hadn't been seen uh, prior to that. We then moved on to 1995 to the, the Data Protection Directive, which was a mainstay of the data protection legal framework for over two decades. And then, of course, a very important development in 2009 uh, with the, the launch of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms and uh, the Article 8 insertion in that charter, which gave uh, primary law, uh, EU law imperative to data protection. Uh, and then that was followed in, in 2018 by the coming into effect of GDPR and the Law Enforcement Directive followed by the regulation on data protection in the EU institutions. So the reason for giving that quick uh, flight through uh, the development of data protection policy in Europe over the last 40 years um, is to say to you that I think it is very important for you as you go into this competition to have this perspective on where the rules of data protection came from within the European Union, to know why those rules are in place uh, why they developed and what they're seeking to achieve. And I think as you do your work in data protection, you will find that uh, this historical perspective will help you to understand in given sorts of circumstances, uh, whether processing of personal data is lawful or not. So moving on very quickly to the second area, which uh, I promised I, I, would, I would outline some practical suggestions uh, to help you uh, understand how you might be expected to implement the rules, the rules on data protection. Um, as you go through this competition and as you hopefully work in the EU institutions, you will have to demonstrate an ability to analyze a set of circumstances or processing operations to decide if the processing of personal data in any given circumstance meets the test of being lawful fair, necessary, and proportionate within our data protection framework. Um, the first and most important thing in achieving that is for you to understand what personal data is. Now, that might seem, you know, a, an unnecessary thing to say, but um, it, it is important to understand how people tend to struggle with understanding the concept of personal data and its extensive scope. Many people, even professionals in the field of data protection, struggle to understand this concept of personal data and its scope. We can easily identify with the identification factors of personal data, my name, my address, my email address, my uh, IP address. They're the obvious things that indicate that data is personal data. But in order to truly understand personal data, it is important for you to have a fuller understanding of the scope of that personal data, how the data relates to the person as an individual, how it relates to them in, in relation to how people judge them and, um, and their achievements. So the scope of personal data is very wide indeed. I'm going to refer you to an old opinion on of the, the Article 29 Working Party on Data Protection, which was the forerunner of the European Data Protection Board. It's opinion four of 2007 
on the concept of personal data. And I highly recommend that you read that and familiarize yourself with it because it gives an excellent insight into the full range and scope of personal data. Uh, the, the second important thing to understand uh, in analyzing um, the lawfulness of data processing activities is the actual act of processing itself. Um, people could be forgiven for thinking that, that processing is a fairly tight um, activity, but in actual fact, if you look at GDPR, for instance, there are 14 different acts of processing of personal data identified in GDPR alone. Uh, starting with collecting the personal data uh, right through to the er erasure or destruction of that data. So it's important to understand the scope of processing activities to be able to identify all the acts of processing by a data controller or processor. If you're looking at a set of processing operations, unless you're familiar with all the different acts of processing, you will make mistakes in relation to the, the analyzing of, of that data. Um, I often used to hear people in the Data Protection Commission when I worked there saying, I'm not processing this data. It's just sitting there inert and dormant. Um, well, of course, you know, you don't act actually have to be doing something with the data in order for to be processing it. The very, the very fact that you have the data is enough to um, to, to be processing that data. So a, a full understanding of of the processing uh, is very, very important. And, and finally, just on that, on that section, uh, it's also important to have a very good understanding, not only of the legal basis for the processing, but also how that legal basis interacts with the principles of data protection, uh, the principles of fair processing, proportionality, and necessity. Um, I often uh, heard people saying, you know, I, I have a legal basis for that processing and the person gave me their uh, unambiguous informed consent. Um, but of course, that's only part of the, of, of the position. Uh, once you have that consent, you still have to process that, that data in a manner that's fair and proportionate and doesn't go beyond what is strictly necessary. So understand personal data, understand the processing activities, and understand the legal basis and principles of data protection. If you put the three of those together, I think you will be able to analyze any set of processing operations or circumstances and arrive at a good conclusion in relation to whether the processing was lawful or not. And the third and final section uh, I wanted to share with you was a, just a personal observation where I think the uh, policy of data protection in the European Union might be going in the future. Um, I think it's vital for you as candidates in these competition to uh, understand the future policy direction uh, of data protection because you are the ones that will be in a position to influence that direction as the next generation of data protection policy makers. Uh, it's also important, I think, to have a, a bigger picture view of uh, the whole policy. It, it's very easy to get bogged down in the minutiae of data protection and to get into the weeds, but to have a bigger pot picture of uh, the what is a very dynamic area and, and an area that has to keep pace with development of digital technologies. So where we are at the moment, all the rules are in place, the protection of the charter is in place, the GDPR and the law enforcement directive are in place, um, and those rules have been future proofed. So it's easy to guess, I think, that the short to medium term direction of policymaking uh, in data protection in the EU might concentrate on the implementation of those rules uh, and things like the cross border enforcement cooperation, which is necessary to keep those rules enforced uh, and active within the, the community. So it's important, I think, for you as candidates to know the difficulties that have arisen in the whole area of enforcement, the challenges before us, as well as the resourcing issues that have been highlighted and how the legal framework might have to be adapted in time to keep pace with, uh, with developments. So I'll stop there, Eamon. Uh, I hope these pointers uh, will help the candidates in some way to identify some of the key issues they might uh, have to engage with as they go forward in applying for these positions. And um, 
happy to try to answer any questions as well. John, many thanks indeed for an excellent uh, scene setter for us, uh, providing us with that um, quite in-depth and I think really helpful um, background as to you know what is involved here. Um, we might move straight away then to Maria uh, Serfiotti, who is going to uh, give us the episode perspective, set out what's involved in this competition uh, and talk nuts and bolts for us. Uh, over to you, Maria. Thank you very much, Eamon, uh, for the opportunity to talk to you today about the latest EPSO uh, competition. Uh, just give me a second. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Um, I have a very short presentation just to take you through. I hope you all see it. OK, uh, that's great. So. Uh, so the latest uh, competition, as we're talking now today about the data protection, was published last week and will run until the 12th of October. Um, we will uh, uh, draw up a list of uh, 76 experts uh, in order for seven institutions and bodies of the uh, EU to uh, select um, the future um, administrators in the function group AD6. It is worth noting that uh, the place of recruitment could be Brussels or Luxembourg. So uh, those candidates that uh, wish to apply, they should have that in mind. Uh, the data protection experts that uh, will be recruited will carry out a large variety of, of, of duties. Um, I'm, I've listed just a few of them here. Um, I'm not going to go into, uh, into the detail. You will find all that in the notice of the competition. I will talk about that and how you can find it later on. It's, um, it's a long list and it's indicative uh, because it depends actually on the institution that uh, will um, uh, recruit uh, the successful candidates. Uh, so the list is uh, long and it depends where uh, you will be uh, selected to, uh, to work. Now, in order to apply, uh, there are some general conditions. Um, you the candidates have to be uh, full, have to enjoy full rights as a citizen of uh, EU member state, and they have to meet any obligation under the national laws for military service. They should also meet the character, uh, the character requirements for the duties concerned, and that is a general rule uh, about appropriate behavior and ethical standards uh, for being an EU official. Now, specific conditions um, in order to be eligible, that would be a university diploma after following at least three years of studies. Uh, followed by at least three years of professional experience related to the field of the competition. Now, you will probably notice that the university diploma subject is a bit vague. There is no specific requirement, but the professional experience has to be on this on the subject of data protection. Uh, lastly, uh, you must have a knowledge of at minimum C1 level for uh, two official EU languages. Now, the language is a bit of a tricky issue as experience shows, so I'm going to clarify a bit about this. Um, the candidates, when they, the applicants, uh, when they apply, they will uh, be asked to uh, select uh, a language, uh, their number one language. That language has to be one of the official 24 EU languages. And they will also be asked to select a language number two. And that must be either English or French and must be different from language number one. I'll give you an example about that. If, you, if the applicant selects um, as language number one uh, English, then the language number two will have to be French. However, if they select as language number one Gaelic, then the language number two could be English. And for this specific uh, competition, uh, the requirement is at least for a, a level C1. Um, and the reason for that is that that's the minimum um, level required to provide legal analysis, both orally as well as in writing. 
Now, what is the procedure? Um, if this competition is of interest, you will have to go to our website and uh, create an account. If you already have an account, uh, then um, you should not create another one because there is a limit to only one account per person. And um, when you validate your application, you cannot make any more changes. So please be very careful with that. And I would also recommend not to uh, do your application the very last day. Uh, give that some thought and, uh, and do it in advance. And you can save it and go back. So you can give you a bit of time to rethink and made any modifications uh, you might find necessary. Uh, once you have validated uh, your application, um, uh, you will be invited to uh, the stage one, which is eliminatory stage. And it's about a computer-based field related test that can take place either online or in an accredited EPSO center. And that will be in language number two, that will be English or French. Uh, you will be informed by your EPSO account if this will be online or in an accredited center, so it depends the situation. Um, and if you um, have um, uh, gathered uh, the highest scores, uh, then you will be uh, invited to stage number two, which is the assessment center. And um, there you will be uh, assessed in eight competencies. That would also be in uh, language number two, English or French. And it could also be online or in an accredited um, um, EPSO center. Uh, the competencies will be tested via the case study as well as a situational interview. And um, an example of some competencies is communication, resilience, delivering quality and results, leadership, and a few more. Uh, the list is extensive in the, in the in notice of the competition. If you obtain uh, the pass marks after stage two, you will be invited to uh, sit on a computer-based reasoning tests that will be abstract, numerical, or verbal, and that will take place in the language number one, so one of the 24. It could also be either online or in an accredited EPSO center. After all this, uh, the selection board will check all the supporting information that you have, the supporting documents and the information that you have provided in your uh, application and uh, will prepare the reserve list with those uh, um, applicants who have obtained the highest marks. Um, I know that um, um, the, the procedures, uh, selection procedures of EPSO are quite long. I just want to ask for the patience of the candidates. Uh, we are working very hard to um, adapt, to uh, become faster and um, also adapt through the COVID situation. So please bear with us and be patient. <laughs> and um, now, uh, how to apply? You have to go to our website. This is a data protection uh, uh, specific page and you will find all the information there. The most important document is the notice of competition. That's a legal document. It contains all the information in detail about the competition, uh, uh, the requirements in detail, the, the duties in detail, the competencies that you will be um, assessed. And um, you have to read that very, very carefully. Uh, you will also find instructions to apply online for those who have not done it in the past, sample tests, as well as the anchors to assess the competencies. So that's to that give you an idea of how we will assess uh, those eight competencies. Um, I'm also included in this uh, presentation. Uh, you will receive it after this webinar uh, and with the links uh, there are uh, rules. Uh, it's not really rules, it's are actually the rights and obligations. It's just to give you an indication of the salaries, the benefits, um, information about our um, 
health insurance allowances and all that information that um, you you might uh, need to know. I can I don't have the time to go in depth. This is a, it's it's a really long and depends also on the individual. So it, it doesn't it's not a standard for for a specific person. So it's better if you look at it to know more uh, about the the rights and the obligations. And um, so if you have questions on your applications, your test or your selection procedure, you can contact us via this link. It is also in our website, of course. I just provided here for uh, uh, convenience and we will get back to you uh, in, within three working days. The uh, inquiries we receive is really high, so also bear with us. Uh, we're doing our best. And um, that's all from me. Thank you for the attention and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Maria. Um, and uh, I think again, that gives people a pretty clear idea of what's involved and the steps they need to take in relation to this competition. And now, um, you know, we've, we've had already a piece on sort of the broader policy area We've looked at the nuts and bolts of the competition, and maybe Christian, this is a good place then to bring you in because I think you're going to talk a little bit about your own career path and maybe the lived reality of a, of a role like this. So over to you, Christian. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Eamon. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. Um, I want to leave lots of time for questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can, but um, I, I actually um, took part in the the competition for this specialism in um, in 2015. I think it was the first one um, of its kind, or at least uh, the first one for quite a while before. Um, so, uh, you know, I've got experience of doing the the competition and of and of um, uh, working within the the area for for the best part of 10 years now. Um, I'll I'll start with what I'm doing right now, um, just to show you how the the trajectory is, has 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 uh, brought me to where I am now um, in my career. I'm I'm in the European Commission. I work in uh, in Directorate General Connect, which is responsible for digital policy. Um, and uh, as Eamon said, I'm 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 based in the the cybersecurity and digital privacy uh, unit, and I and I do some work there. But I'm I'm also um, uh, deployed to to another unit of DG Connect, which is um, um, in their building in Luxembourg, they're split in two locations between Brussels and Luxembourg. Um, and uh, with that, with that unit, I'm I'm working on something called the Data Act, um, which is um, part of a, a wider data strategy. You might have heard of the Digital Services Act proposal, Digital Markets Act, the the AI propose uh, artificial intelligence proposal earlier this year, um, and um, yeah, the Data Act is, is not um, a data protection uh, proposal. Um, it's, it's planned for the end of this year, but it, it is something which will, which will overlap considerably with, with, um, with data protection and, and, um, and build on the GDPR. Um, so that's what I'm working on now. I'm also doing, a, um, I'm, I'm managing or overseeing a, a study uh, which is about to launch into, into ad tech, um, online advertising, and um, its effect on privacy and its effect on uh, the European economy, particularly advertisers and publishers. Um, and I've, I've been working as well on cybersecurity and the new cybersecurity strategy, um, which was published in December last year. Uh, before that, um, as, as John said, I was working in the, um, the European Data Protection Supervisors um, office. I was the, the head of the private office for the supervisor uh, for, for several years. Um, and indeed, they're, they're one of the. Uh, you know, they were they were the first, uh, I think, agency or or bod EU body to request this specialist competition. Um, they're they're very keen to attract the best uh, the best people in, into data protection and into uh, the EU institutions. Um, while I was there, um, I worked very closely with um, with with colleagues in the in the uh, data protection commission with with Helen Dixon. I was over to Dublin quite a lot. Um, they they were and they they are very much at the eye of the storm, 
um, similar to what Eamon and, and John was saying that you know the the, the size and the importance of the, the tech industry in in in, in Ireland is um, you know out of all proportion to the to the size of the country um, and um, and all eyes are on are on um, are on the DPC when it comes to um, enforcement of the GDPR and and um, making data protection a reality on the ground. So you know we, we you know in EDPS we were working hard to support them. Um, before um, before EDPS, I was I was also in the commission as, as a seconded national expert, um, and I was working on um, data data retention, which is about law enforcement's access to to communications data. Very controversial, um, and obviously a very important data protection concern, um, and and more generally on internal security. Um, and I was I was on secondment from the from the Ministry of Justice in London. You might detect from my accent that uh, I grew up in London. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's my career path. It's it's been um, uh, it, it, it's I've I've sort of fell into data protection. Um, almost by accident, as, as I think most people now in, in, the, in the profession would say. Um, I just wanted to end by sort of endorsing what, what John was saying about um, data protection in Europe. You know, it, it's, um, it's trying to do two different things. It, it's, there's an economic um, imperative of, of building the internal market and ensuring data can flow freely. Um, and the EU is, is at its heart an economic project. Um, but it's also about um, the safeguarding of fundamental rights, and um, that's more important than ever in the digital age, when when basically everything, all of our lives are on are online, um, data flying around everywhere, without uh, without us knowing about it. So um, it's both of those themes are um, are at the heart of EU values. Um, and what I've noticed, you know, it's interesting to see that that this in this current competition, they're looking to recruit seventy six people to the list. Um, in my competition, I think it was more like 25. So that's just six years ago. So it just show it, it just demonstrates, you know, threefold increase in in the um, in in the demand for data protection experts in the EU institutions. And it really demonstrates how um, data protection from being very much on the margins, a sort of technical set of rules 10 years ago, to being you know really mainstream and and um, and global. You know, we have. We have the the China. It's has 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 just adopted a, a law on personal information protection, um, which is very similar to the GDPR. I mean, obviously there are it's under an authoritarian regime, so it's a bit different. But in in in, in a technical sense, it's very close to the the principles uh, that we have in EU data protection. So I think it's a very exciting time to to be thinking about um, a career in this area. Thanks, Christian. That's that's really helpful uh, again to give us those uh, perspectives and indeed kind of a sense of what the trajectory might be in, in, for somebody considering, uh, it, you know, going on in their career in this area within the European uh, Union institutions. Let me at this point just maybe give a reminder in terms of Sido uh, S L I dot D O, and uh, then the uh, hashtag is EU Jobs. If you do want to pose questions. We have a couple have come in and I'm going to start with those and I have one or two questions of my own as well that I'd like to explore with our panel over the next, say, 10 to 15 minutes or so. Um, let's begin with a question uh, on Slido, which is asking, and this one is for you, Maria. Uh, this is asking, will EBSO provide sample tests for the field-related computer-based tests? Maria. Well, that's a very good uh, question. Um... Uh, which I'm not sure I, I know the answer actually. Uh, we normally have generic uh, sample tests in our in our website, so um, I'm not sure we're going to provide actually um, a specific a field related uh, sample test. Uh, stay tuned though, and keep an eye on the website in case it is something uh, uh, comes up. But I'm 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 not sure it will. Sorry about that. Thanks, Maria. Uh, and again, good advice at the end. Stay tuned uh, in case there are developments. Um, next one from Slido that has come in. Uh, I think it's a good question. It comes up uh, frequently in our uh, webinars in relation to various competitions for EU jobs. 
And the question is, if one of my languages, and this is for, I think, probably you, Maria, but uh, Christian, you may, you, may have, you may have a view on this as well. Uh, if one of my languages is stronger, which, for the purposes of the competition, should I designate as number one or number two? Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll leave to Christian to say the practical afterwards. Uh, I, I think it depends on which one um, the person, the candidate feels more comfortable. Uh, you have to bear in mind that uh, language number one will be only one, well, one stage, uh, the one on the numerical, um, the, the reasoning test, numerical, abstract and, um, and verbal. Uh, while all the others, uh, stage one and two, will be in language number two. Uh, it depends where the candidate feels more confident, and uh, it's it's very difficult for me to say. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to Christian. I think it's the individual matter, really. Christian, have you got a view on this? Well, I can only offer my own um, experience. I, I I I spent a few years in Italy. Um, uh, a while ago, and and um, and so I put my first language as uh, as Italian. So I did the tests in Italian, and I did everything else in English, um, and seemed to work out okay. Um, most people assume that you have to you have to um, put put the second language as the more difficult one, but I don't think I don't think those are the rules. I think it's it's simply that one language has to be English or French. Um, and another one has to be an official language, so I, d I don't think they, I don't think they they um, they they test your um, your your ethnicity or anything like that to see whether you you should have that particular language as one of the one of the two. Thanks, Christian. Um, another one here that uh, perhaps uh, Christian, maybe you you might have a view on, uh, and also Maria, you you, you, you could. Maybe give a, a perspective to uh, the question is um, along the following lines. Uh, the person asking the question says, "I do not consider myself uh, to currently be a, an expert in inverted commas on data protection, but several data protection issues uh, have arisen in teams that I have managed over the years." Um, can you say a bit more about what is expected in terms of the experience of data protection that you might have? Uh, well, uh, the notice of the competition is a bit, uh, let's say, vague on this because it asks uh, an experience of three years and that's the, um, the requirement. Then it is up to the selection board to, to, to judge if that is sufficient or not. Uh, so my personal advice is to uh, apply and you put all the uh, professional experience you have um, and list um, the, your duties and what you've been doing and, and then leave that to the selection board to judge themselves because they will be the experts. They will be experts on the field and they are the best to judge about um, if uh, uh, the candidate will be suitable uh, for uh, the job. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Um... Maybe just uh, a question, uh, and you know, uh, this has again come up uh, frequently in our webinars uh, over recent months. Um, Maria, maybe I think you have stressed this, but if there's anything further you, you might want to bring out on this, uh, and it seems like an obvious uh, enough thing, but how important is it to read the full notice of competition? I mean, they can be quite lengthy documents, and I know candidates occasionally you know ask us do we really need to 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 read it all and i think i know what your answer is going to be maria but maybe say a word on this please i really feel uh, everyone who is reading the notes of competition i had done my share of reading them and also for my own competition that i passed it's a, a nightmare i know <laughs> um but it's very very important it's the most important document uh, you have uh, the candidates have to read it thoroughly 
uh, everything is there and it's a legal document. That's why it's a bit dry. That's why it's long. Um, that's why it's not very user friendly, unfortunately. Uh, but um, it's really worth the, the time and uh, the investment to, to read it. It has a really, um, it's really informative. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, you definitely have to do it. You won't find that information on the website. Everything in that document, this is the most important one. So please uh, read it very, very carefully and from uh, cover to cover, as they say. Thanks, Maria. Um, maybe for all of the, the panelists, they, they might want to give a perspective uh, on this, and I suppose it's, it's more from uh, a personal uh, you know, perspective. For someone considering applying um, for one of these roles, but who, who, who may be wondering just about life in, in Brussels and Luxembourg, uh, where the roles are based, um, do you have any kind of personal insights you'd want to share about what it's like to live in either of those cities? Maybe I'll come in there. Go on, John. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've lived in, in Brussels now for uh, for three years. Um, it's not true to say the weather is as bad as it is in Ireland. It depends on what part of Ireland you're from, I suppose. Um, but altogether, uh, a very a very very pleasant place to live. If you're worried about uh, language skills. Um, the difficulty you will have in Brussels as an English speaker is probably trying to practice your French or your Dutch or whichever uh, you speak because uh, it seems everybody wants to speak English. Um, most of the work, if not all of the work of the institutions uh, are done in English uh, and, and most social activity uh, tends to be very English orientated as well. Other than that, uh, Brussels in particular is, um, is a great place to um, to use as a center for traveling to other parts of, uh, of Europe. There's a fantastic train service in Belgium. Uh, it can get you literally anywhere in a relatively short period of time. So yeah, I would, I would have no hesitation in, in, um, in, in recommending life here. Christian or Maria, do you want to jump in on this? Uh, I can um, I can say my personal experience. Uh, I was living in Luxembourg for 13 years. I was in another institution before, and um, and now I'm in Brussels. So it's uh, both uh, ci well cities and countries are really welcoming. Um, Luxembourg is very international, actually. Um, um, almost uh, half of the population is uh, <laughs> are expats. Um, uh, English is mainly used almost everywhere, and all also the admin and the government. Everybody, everybody speaks English, so you won't have to. Um, you won't have any problems. Um, and uh, and the good thing about the having a new career is that if uh, you are recruited in one place that maybe you think it doesn't suit you. You can, uh, after after some years, uh, change like I did. Um, I didn't change for the, I didn't leave Luxembourg because I didn't like it. It was a work decision, uh, but um, that's the good thing about having an EU career. You can uh, change and get another opportunity and another job in another city, in another country. So um, that's my share on that. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. You're welcome to, to come in on this if you, if you want to. But no. uh, I think it's getting quite clear in terms of Luxembourg and Brussels as good places to, to, to live. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. Um, uh, it, it's the on the languages. What was the striking thing? I, I, I arrived here in 2008 and um, and it was still uh, you know, French was being spoken a lot in the institution still. It, I'd say it's about 50-50, depending on which part of the commission you're in. Um, that's all changed now. I mean, you, it's very rare to have um, have a meeting in French or an exchange of emails in French. Um, uh, I, I guess that's that's down mainly to the um, to the the member states that joined in 2004, 2007. Um, the, living in Brussels is is is, is good fun. I mean, it, it's uh, 
um, a lot of a lot of Brussels and Belgium generally it's a very complex place and and you kind of discover things that you weren't expecting so it's full of it's full of surprises um, the weather's not that bad um, and um, and and as 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 John said you can you can um, you can connect to the rest of Europe very easily you can get to get to Netherlands so the Dutch coast is beautiful um, and then the mountains in uh, in Germany and, and Switzerland so yeah it's a good place. Okay, just coming uh, back maybe then to uh, as Slido begins to hot up a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious that the clock is is uh, is running against us, but there are a few more questions on sort of nuts and bolts practicalities, Maria, and I might just bunch a couple of them for you if that's okay. Uh, the first is, um, do you have any sense of kind of numbers of applications that you would expect from a competition like this? Um, do you have any kind of ballpark sense of that? Um, and then um, an another related question um, is, um, does the choice of language determine what language I fill in the application in? Maria, maybe you could look at both yes. of those. Yes. Uh, the, okay, so the, the number of the applicants. Uh, well, we have significantly, significantly less applicants in comparison to the generalist competition. So uh, I wouldn't expect more than a thousand, I think. Uh, that's even maybe too optimistic. Um, so that's my personal, really, um, expectation. Uh, but uh, data protection is now, it's quite a hot subject as we discussed. So, I wouldn't expect more than that, but that's my personal take um, and experience uh, about the language. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, the application will be in the language the the language you uh, apply will be the language number one, if I'm not mistaken, and that's actually it should be in the notice of the competition. That's why I said you should read it cover to cover. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, but I leave it. It's it's the language number one. So depending which one um, you will select. Thanks, Maria. Um, there's another uh, question which which has uh, come in for, from uh, Lorcan on Sligo, and it just uh, on Sligo, and it asks: uh, um, Is the Department for Affairs taking any action to facilitate remote work from Ireland for EU jobs? The European Commission is currently consulting on its new strategy, uh, including this point. Um, we're very much aware that the institutions, um, as indeed the Irish Public Service is, um, you know, are in the they're all in a period of reflection, really, in terms of uh, especially the pandemic and its uh, implications for work practices and so on. Obviously, um, you know, it is ultimately for the institutions to, to land where they will land on that. Um, the Irish Public Service is planning to issue in the first quarter of next year a blended work policy uh, for ourselves, which may be an important information point in, in this context. Um, Christian, can I move to another Slido question uh, that uh, is addressed specifically to you? And it's, how, how difficult is it to move between EU institutions in the area of data protection? Uh, formally speaking, it's, it's, um, it's not difficult. I mean, once you're, um, once you're on the list and you're you're recruited and you become a, an official, then uh, you're not an official of any particular institution. You're an official of the EU institutions, so um, you you can um, you you can move between the institutions um, freely in, in in theory at least. In reality, I mean, whoever you work for, they'll 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 love you and they'll want to keep you. So you know, it's always a, a negotiation if you want to move. Um, like, uh, but um, now that you know, data protection is is quite a transferable skill. Um, I think you'll find quite a lot of, um, you know, uh, ad, you, you'll, you 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 should have quite an adaptable profile um, if 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 and when you get in. Um, I I moved you know from the commission to to EDPS, which is a separate EU body. And then back to the commission again. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think it's a it's a problem. I would I would just add that um, 
the profile that has has changed a lot in 10 years you know in the, in the past it was all about having specialist lawyers um to understand data protection law which is complicated but now there is a there's a huge drive from data protection authorities especially to have people who understand the technology um in order to be able to uh regulate the um the area so i think it's quite clear now from the description in the or, or in this current competition that they're not they're not necessarily looking for lawyers they're looking for people who who un, who generally understand data protection and what it means for everyday lives and for for the the devices that we use and so on thanks christian uh, in fact that probably segues into what i'm going to take as uh, in fact it is our last question on on the slido and um this question basically asks whether uh, prior experience uh, beyond the three years as a sort of a threshold, uh, would that be taken into account both at the level of the application process uh, as well as on the reserve list or when you become an EU official? Maria, maybe you could say something on that? Uh, yes. Um, so that. Uh will uh, probably show in your um, in in the candidates interview actually that i think that experience that is more than 3 years will give a big advantage uh, to the person um uh, to that will come through uh, through the interview to the selection board um unfortunately the extra experience won't have any impact on the grade and hereby the 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 salary uh, that will be standard because that's what the competition is about so in practical matters it won't have any impact unfortunately uh, but i think it will give the candidate uh, an extra boost uh, on on this uh, competition and the and the procedure thanks maria that, that that's clear um i had said what was going to take a, 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 a that as the last question but one more has squeezed onto slido so let me let me just maybe finish with this uh, this particular question and again Maria, you're in the hot seat, I'm afraid, for this one. It's um, will privacy law certifications uh, like the, uh, is it the CIPP hyphen E, uh, be taken into account when evaluating applications? What if they are acquired just after the application process is closed? Uh, I'm not sure. This is quite technical, but I don't think it will be for the application. It might be after. Um, come up afterwards uh, during the the procedure okay thanks look we we may get uh you know it's good to see the level of interest that's out there and we may get more questions on slido and we'll try and pick those up ourselves after this webinar and perhaps with um, maria's assistance come back to, to to any outstanding questions i think we've covered sure. a lot uh, and I want to thank uh, you know those those who've been actively putting their questions because of course it's a benefit for everybody to have this information out there. So maybe with that I I, I will draw us uh, to a close. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to thank again our speakers. Uh, sincere thanks to to my own colleague here at the representation, John Keys. Thank you to to Maria Serfiotti for taking the time to present all the details of the competition, and to Christian for sharing his experience with us. I, I also want to just uh, put on record my own appreciation for my own team, uh, Mike Williams and Maria Sternitivo, who uh, put together uh, the webinar. Uh, it's been a pretty interesting one for somebody who, who uh, uh, you know, I think even as a generalist uh, has an interest in this area. Uh, I hope that it's offered encouragement uh, to those who are thinking about uh, uh, applying for this, these roles. Uh, uh, and again, I want to stress that the Department of Foreign Affairs is willing and able to assist those who apply uh, for EU jobs. Uh, that support is available. Uh, do get in contact with us again. The address is eujobs at dfa.ie. Uh, if you are thinking of applying for EU jobs, uh, we will be responsive to you uh, and try to, to assist you whatever way we can. If you want to re-watch this webinar or, or share it with someone you know, um, then it will be available on the DFA YouTube uh, account very shortly. And you can also follow us on Twitter at EU Jobs Ireland to keep up to date uh, with all of our upcoming events and with the various traineeships and job opportunities in, in the European Union. So listen, thank you very much again for joining us uh, and uh, uh, good luck.